media coverage provided by the CyberWire. Our popular daily cybersecurity news brief and daily podcast are online at thecyberwire.com. We are able to help extend the reach of the 2017 Women in Cybersecurity Conference keynotes thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. IBM. Silence and Cybersec Jobs. So welcome. This is such an exciting, exciting event. And I'm, I'm so honored to be here and shocked at the volume. <laughs> so um, I, I have two girls of my own. And so if you don't mind for a second, um, I need to take a selfie. <laughs> okay, everybody. You in the back, you're not smiling. <laughs> Yay, say hi, Identity Girls. Hi. Yay, thank you. It didn't happen if it's not on Snapchat, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> on Facebook too. I, I'm, a, I'm a Facebooker from when I lied to get on board when it was still .edu. Not that I'd admit that in public, but I might. Um, so I want to talk to you mostly about career stuff. We're going to take a little dip of toe into the, the fun and fascinating world of data privacy and protection as well. But primarily, I was asked to really talk about um, the, the career that I've had, like many of you, like I would say the majority of you, most of the careers that you will endeavor will not exist today. There'll be jobs that you invent yourself in the future. And that's a daunting task. You know, there was once upon a time when women were, if you were educated at all, my grandmother has a degree in mathematics from the University of, now it's called Rutgers, but it was the University of New Jersey. She was one of two women who graduated with a graduate degree in mathematics. And she was told, lucky you, you get to be a teacher. Not a researcher, not an academic, a nurse or a teacher, and maybe a secretary. And I think the world has changed dramatically. When I was a little girl, my first trip to law school, I had to do it twice, I'm a little slow. I was picked up at, in the afternoon after kindergarten and my mother would take me to night school with her where she attended law school on the GI Bill where my dad had gone through the years before her also on the GI Bill coming out of the Air Force. So my family is one where we are geeky, we're fluid, we're multitaskers, so I kind of come by this naturally, as it were. Let me see if I'm just taking notes here. Oh, I can click too. I'm multitasking. So I love this quote from Leonardo da Vinci, and I'll read it to you because it's a little bit long. It had long come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. Think about that and think about Leonardo da Vinci. There were women last night who were talking about, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a public policy person, I'm in, I'm in art school, I'm not 100% why I'm here. This is why you're here. We need to happen to things, not let them happen to us. And we need, as Chad was talking about, that diverse background experience to experience what are the products and services we want to build and demand in the future with our newly found financial wealth and capital power, but also what are the problems wreaked by the havoc of 50% of women in the workplace? Because we know we're sneaky. <laughs> and only we can really address those new risks as they come along. So this is the world we know and love. Everything digital, everything disrupted, the internet of things, edge computing. Think about how different our lives and careers will be over time when we have self-driving cars, when we figure out how to secure clouds and internet of things. Imagine, if you will, what we can paint with our minds. Imagine the relationships that we can have that cross geographical, religious, gender, and other types of borders, simply because we can find out that one person out of the seven billion souls who shares an interest, a passion, or can help buy, sell, trade, or communicate with us. It's an incredible challenge, and it's here now. 
For years and years in the tech industry, we've been focused on will it work? Little blinky lights, speeds and feeds. Look, our system is scalable. Can I have $5 million, please? Look, it won't go down on Saturdays. It's 24 by seven, it's five nines. Who effing cares? <laughs> we do care, I'm being a bit flip. We like our sustainability, we like to have sound systems that actually do what they, we think they're gonna do, but now is the new era. Now we get to tell the machines what to do. We have the responsibility of what happens when we make decisions online and we knit together the most powerful compute farm that really is influenced and modeled after the human brain. So there's never been a better time and a more important time to embark upon the field. So this is where the flying pigs thing comes in. Um, how did I get here is a long and rambling journey. And I know, where's, where's Melanie? I'm calling you out, look at Mikey little cutie pie, graduate from Carnegie Mellon University, brilliant, brilliant woman, one of the architects of the high school program. I will call you out. <laughs> and I love that she just like, she's like, here, here I am with my pink hair. Well, we're having a dialogue on, on Facebook. Thank you, Facebook, for being there. Um, about, you know, what's the next career move? And I didn't tell her I was gonna do this, so I'm just totally violating your privacy every which way but lose. That's kind of my jam. Um, and I was fascinated by the advice of uh, old dogs like me and some of the middle career people who were just saying, you know, try this, try this, try this. And it just struck me of like, Melanie, dude, try everything. Just start, just begin. So when I started out um, as an undergraduate, I actually have a degree in psychology, which if you know me, I probably need, it probably was a self-service thing that I didn't realize at the time. Uh, but I worked in robotics and, and educational robotics, and my role was to document the behavior of students as they used a RICO uh, arm, and we hacked together an Apple IIe Plus system. Anybody still remember Apple IIe Pluses? A couple of us out there, it was a thing. Green screen, um, very buggy, everything bespoke code. To my earlier point, we were just barely making it work. And the interesting thing is every kid figured out how to, how to hack a bug in the system and grab a beaker of water or fluid or, or some other thing and then reset the machine, which would then go crazy like this. And the kid would sit back in whatever physical capability they had and laugh. And that one moment really has been the guiding light for my entire career. What would it mean for the technology to work is a fascinating, interesting, hard problem to solve. What would it mean if what you built mattered? It matters to the administration. It matters to those parents trying to educate their severely handicapped children. It matters to the 18-year-old punk who doesn't know what she's gonna do with her life but is fascinated by self-efficacy and the ability for technology to actually solve real humanity challenges. So that's where I began. I, I moved to New York City, became a patent litigator, loved it, hated the lifestyle, accidentally fell face first into Sun Microsystems. I literally got a call from a recruiting person and she said, oh, this is a trademark lawyer who does a little bit of patents and it was totally a lie. So in many ways, identity misrepresentation is the foundation of my privacy career. <laughs> Sometimes you never know how things are gonna work out. Uh, but I ended up at Sun, and this is right after Scott McNeely, who is still a friend and, and was my boss at Sun, said, you have zero privacy, and followed up with a hearty, get over it. You know, my PR people think they have trouble with me. Scott's people deserve gold medals all day long. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple here. <laughs> and and the, the interesting thing is at that time, and why this is so important to those of you just setting out on a career path, and because you hear take risks, take risks, take risks. At the time, it didn't feel like a risk to take on the privacy portfolio when the CEO was saying there was no such thing as privacy, when Larry Ellison was nodding madly in agreement, when governments were saying just put everything in a data lake and we'll, we'll handle it from here, thank you very much. What could possibly go wrong? It didn't feel like I was taking a risk. It didn't feel like I was diving in. It didn't feel like I was about to walk away from my law degree that I earned in night school the second time around after I went with mom. It felt like I was fixing a problem 
for people who needed me again. When no one else in the research community in the robotics lab was looking at the child, my whole job was to look at the child and, and make sure that they were learning their lessons. And my whole job became advocating for that individual. So it didn't feel like a risk, but I jumped into privacy headfirst, and then 9-11 happened. And it didn't, you know, like Da Vinci, you can either let stuff happen to you or you can happen to stuff. And that was a moment for all of us in cyber where we really had to say, it's time for an ethical and a moral choice to be made. Do we sit back and trample all over every civil liber liberty? Do we put down decades and millennia of free speech evolution and hope to catch the next 19 murderers? Or do we get smart? Do we get innovative? Do we get creative? Do we invite in the people who are taking liberal arts degrees? and ask them what the uh, user interface would look like? Do we start designing as if we, we understood that this is a global society and we are under attack in many ways, in negative ways? Do we understand that we need to hack our own balance sheets and get information, as Grace Hopper said in 1965? Let that one settle in on you. 1965, she said that information should be on the balance sheet, for it, it is every bit as powerful as the hardware and software that processes it. It's time, and it's time now. And in addition to everyone's shared experience around 9-11, I had a six-day-old daughter in my arms, and I had to look at my little Riley and say, is this the world I want for you? Is this the world that you deserve? Just a little identity that was nothing more than like a little person that I loved and no one else knew. And here we are 15 years later, all of this hair dye is because of her. <laughs> but she's strong, and she's beautiful, and she's creative, and she's fearless. All of those things that I can say about the ladies in this room. So about two years ago, um, gosh, maybe three years ago, I published a book, The Privacy Engineer's Manifesto. Wrote it with my best friend, business partner, Jonathan Fox, who works with me again. Uh, he's worked with me for four different companies now and is back with me at Cisco. And I was approached by John Stewart from Cisco. Now, if you don't know John Stewart from Cisco, please look him up, get to know him, honor him. He's one of the really pioneers in cybersecurity and national security. And he approached me in an airport and said, I read your book, and we want that. And I said, I'm sorry, John. I'm breaking up with hardware. You people don't get privacy. Two things. One, there's a PR person somewhere going, didn't someone tell her we don't just do hardware anymore? <laughs> we don't just do hardware. We do digital. And so when I dug into the company and I started getting to know the personality of the company and the personalities of the company, I found that same human kindness that I encountered back in the 80s working with those students. The same kind of risk-taking behavior where a computer science laboratory helped me go for NSF grants to make sure that the people at home that were taking care of these students had food stamps, had clothes to wear. It had nothing to do with robotics, but it had everything to do with robotics because if my students weren't in the classroom and taken care of and their parents weren't behind the program, Nobody would get to the benefit of all this great technology. Cisco is that kind of company. Actually, I'm going to stand up, my little Cisco friends. You guys need to get to know these ladies and gentlemen. Tony Jeffs is here. It's a privilege, and I think it. And I think it's. Um, it is true for many of these organizations could stand up and say similar things. We, you don't pick your career based on this like 80 year trajectory and billions and billions of dollars and all of that stuff. Pick your first move because there's something inside of you, either it's a match with your knowledge, your skills, your hopes, your dreams, or someone who's just kind. We need more kindness in our careers. The first models of, of leadership that I had, and I'm way off my slides, so I'm, I'm in trouble with I have gorgeous slides today because I didn't do them myself. <laughs> I'm going to go through that. The people that you interact with will shape your thinking. The minute your job becomes easy, as Chad and I were chatting right before uh, this, 
this uh, breakfast, he said, you know, I, I knew I needed to pivot in my career when I could do all of my work in two hours. And I love that because that's exactly true. When you start to get so good that you think you're good, it's time to stretch. It's time to run. It's time to change. It's time to get scared. I have my partner, Sandy Thompson, is here. She's like mortified that I'm calling her out. She's the next CPO at Cisco today. She's the next CPO. I'm, I'm pointing out to the outfields because what she does is, is operationalize all of the strategy that we're working on to assign data valuations, to build IoT networks that are robust, that are segmented, that leverage everything we know about containers and VMs and identities that we've worked so hard for over these last decades. We're putting that amalgam together to work for humanity. And we're working very hard to make sure that there are three people always in our, in our worldview. The person that we follow, the person who stands beside us for the entire journey, and the person that we turn around and clear the way for and pull along with us. And we have to have those three people at all times because they all give back to you in different ways and you give back to them in different ways that you can't even imagine. I know that had nothing to do with that last slide. <laughs> Go with it. All the detail-oriented engineers are like, that did not follow the slide. This is why we need diversity. <laughs> Always have a vision. I mean, it sounds so obvious. Here's the thing about vision. Vision sucks. I'm a girl who had a vision, and it's a cocky thing to say, but I knew that privacy was a thing the minute I did a Markman chart of all of the products and services that my company was selling and compared it to all the laws, rules, and regulations, and that was actually possible back in 2000. It would be a, quite a feat and probably take an entire graduate degree to do it today. But back in that time, that's exactly what I did. I said, here's our capabilities, here's our function, here's our, our profit sheet, and here are all the laws and, and regulations so we understand the clear path. And I said, you know, what's going to happen is this utility compute that we called grid back then, that we call cloud now, is inevitable. It's as inevitable as the trend going from a home generator to relying on power grids. And it will age just as power grids have done. It will become vulnerable just as power grids have done. And women and men like you will solve those problems too and pivot to, to what's next. But having a vision, and particularly a vision in privacy when your own CEO says that you're full of garbage, is lonely. So do have a vision. Trust your vision. Trust your gut. Trust your experience. Find that person that's your drinking buddy that probably isn't the, the boss that's telling you no all the time. But it's a painful thing to have a journey, a, a vision. And honor that. Because sometimes in those lonely times when it's just you all alone with your vision and you really doubt that this could even be a thing ever, the next day when you wake up with a new idea about how to get closer to that vision, you'll know you were right. And you'll know that that loneliness will pay off because someone else has shared that vision. And suddenly, you've got a momentum going. And you, and you bring people into your community with you. So don't be afraid of a vision, but don't, don't think that it's like writing a, a topic sentence for a paragraph, because it's so much more. I love this, first of all, because it kind of looks like my 15-year-old. She's kind of a little badass, I have to say. Uh, the factory of the future will have only two employees, a human and a dog. There's a management consultant said this quote, and I think it's really interesting. And the, the, the joke is that the human will be there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the human away from the damn machines. <laughs> Don't mess anything up. How many times as IT professionals, they've been like, just please stop touching things, Michelle. You're going to make it worse. But I think what that means is we all need to reconsider what is the future of work. There are 1.6 million estimated jobs in cyber. What does that mean? How many people in cyber hate the word cyber? I feel you. I do use it in social media because it's a thing. But what does that even mean? There are so many subspecialties and segments within the cyber and privacy and information security and information products and data management and data assessment and data audit and data finance and hedge funds based on IoT data that don't exist today. So just because there's a dog and a guy 
doesn't mean there's no place for humans to work. It just means we really need to rethink what is a value, how are we creating a value exchange across networks, how are we connecting and commuting, commuting, that could be a word, we'll go with that. You know, when John Chambers first was going around and telling people, and there were these beautiful ads in like 2000, 2001, about how Cisco was bridging the world, and you saw little children holding hands, I thought, this is really fascinating. There's no machines on these ads. And that was his vision, was that if you connected enough people, interesting ideas would happen. And it doesn't mean that culture goes away. It means that culture transcends borders. It doesn't mean that the telephone is dead. It means that there's multimodalities for every type of speaker and every type of communicator. And I think that's the future of work. It's as big as your vision. Who has seen this little girl? I love this statue. Who doesn't know what this is? Okay, you're studying too hard for your PhD. Stop that. <laughs> Just kidding. Come work for Cisco. We really need you, bad. Um, <laughs> so this, this artist created this fearless girl facing down the bull of Wall Street. And I think what was really fascinating to me is, of course, we all loved it, and people put their little pink hats on it and were posing with it and stuff. Um, there were also, you know, miscreants doing bad things uh, to the statue. But I think what was fascinating is in some of the comments there was um, this kind of retaliation from, from people that said, how dare she stop progress? Why is she so mad? And I thought, first of all, uh, go back to math because the physics would tell you this girl's not going to actually stop the bull. <laughs> you can look as fierce as you want. That's all I have. I think she's ready to get on the bull. I think she's ready to ride the bull. I think she's ready to be the bull. I don't see this as stopping anyone else from succeeding at their vision or their dreams. But it was fascinating to read that opposing view that I think comes from a place of fear. And you will find in your careers, it's never fluid. You find a place where suddenly you're the smartest person in the room and that's when you should get the hell out of that room and go to the big girl room. But it's hard, and it's scary. And then suddenly you become a vice president. And you know what the most important thing about becoming a vice president is? You have to practice being stupid. <laughs> you know when you're a youngster and you're like, they are so stupid. Why don't they do this, and why don't, and why don't that? And it's so easy, because you're like, you know, the young buck and you're mad. What you find is that you have to really change your skill set from the person who knows everything about something small to the person who is endlessly curious, terrified, and excited about everything. You have to become the person who leads by getting obstacles out of the way for the brilliant people come up. You have to be the person who doesn't write in the comments section of a picture of a young lady standing up with great power and facing the world with, with just absolute passion and say, I'm not afraid of that. I'm on board with her. I'm going to do that. But you'll find as you kind of go through your career, it's always stops and starts. And the other thing I was talking to a dear friend last night about is, is that, you know, don't forget that life is going to happen. Life will happen to you. So I, you know, when, when Cheryl's uh, book first came out, Lean In, do you guys know about that book? Have you heard about that? It's a good book. Same thing. She got, she got kind of blasted for, like, how dare she? She grew up rich and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? That girl had, had to do nothing but strap on a bikini and go sail on a yacht. Brava for speaking out. But I also thought, you know, I remember there was a time in my career where I took a leap and created the role of chief privacy officer. And then another leap where I said, we can industrialize this and put together a portfolio of identity management. And then another leap where I thought, OK, I can do sales. I'll go to Oracle and do sales. And then another leap. Stay here and hope that you guys will get bored and walk away. <laughs> because you can 
get very comfortable down here. <laughs> and you can stay for a long time. And the cupcakes are good and the margaritas are better. <laughs> but for all your leaning, there's just one thing you have to do. You have to like say, you know what? Self-pity sucks. I'm boring everyone that I want to impress. And maybe I was a little bit overly excited. Maybe I should have worked harder to get my budget before I went out and did that program. And maybe I need to learn more. And maybe I need to reach out more. And maybe I need to become more. And suddenly, you're back. And it will happen to every single one of you. You'll get divorced, you'll have a baby that's sick, you'll get laid off from a job that you love. Terrible things happen in the world every single day. It's all on us to get off the floor. So lean in, fine, but stand up. I should really have ended it there because now I'm like, oh, that was kind of a good end. <laughs> I'm going to do what I, I used to tell my clients when I was doing depositions is like, the minute that you've answered the question, shut up. <laughs> they couldn't do it, and neither could I. So I'm going to give you two more things to think about and then let you get on with this wonderful conference. So my legacy, I was really thinking about this with Susan, who makes these gorgeous slides for me. Susan Borton, who is a, just an amazing spirit and an artist and everything I'm not. It's incredible. Um, it was interesting because she wrote this slide of my legacy. What, would, what is my legacy? And that's, a big, that's an even bigger word than vision. So the thing that I care about most about privacy is that after all of the upgrades are done and the bugs are patched and everything happens, the only thing that we have left is data. The only thing we have left is humanity and the stories that people remember about us and share about us and tell about us and feel about us. That's the only thing that lasts and outlasts any sort of technolo you know, technology gadget that supports the flow of that data. So it's a critical thing to think about what, what is your legacy? What is your life? There's no work-life balance. I hope to God no one's going to sit up here on this panel and say, oh, that's a work-life challenge. You just have to have a choice. Maybe. No. <laughs> you have 24 hours every day. There's your balance. Thank you very much for playing. But my legacy is, I, I think my number one, I actually was a very reluctant mother. I wasn't sure that I was supposed to, but I started getting old. <laughs> so I had my first daughter. No regrets, just in case she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> and I have two. I have an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old. And my legacy, if I could only have one, is that I want to be a great mom. I've done a lot of great things in my career. I've been so blessed and so fortunate. I have beautiful friends who've picked me up and lifted me up when I was like covered in vomit and donut dust. <laughs> Not that that would happen to me, but maybe. Could have been last week, for all you know. <laughs> but being a, being a good mom, you know, and partially, you know, if you've not seen the movie Bad Mom, please do. It's just mind candy, but it, you know, it's. It's not perfect mom, it's not Martha Stewart mom, it's not Tiger mom. I want to be the mom that was authentic, that showed my kids that I could pursue my dreams no matter what, that I could lift myself up when I was broken, that I wouldn't have to pretend anymore to be perfect, that I was someone that they could always rely on, even if I have really dumb advice or it's the middle of the night and I don't have any answers either. I will always be there for them. And that's the way I think about my kids. And that's why I would put this first, because that's also how I feel about my team. I feel like there's no work-life balance. When I am engaged at work, it's because I love the people with whom I work. I truly love them as human beings. I love that they all have totally different things. They drive me bananas when they don't do what I want when I want. It drives me bananas that they can't read my mind. 
Lisa Bobbitt, who works for me, is like, yes. So I think that goes to the second one is, you know, she helped others in their personal journeys. And I, pur I purposely didn't say professional because sometimes your personal journey is getting to the next notch in your professional career and sometimes it's not. I had a gal once who, I always have someone has to like have a goal that, that you're almost 100% sure will go to failure. And once upon a time I had a girl who came in and she said two things. She said, one, I don't want to do my reviews with you in the same room anymore. And I was like, why? And she said, you're just too intense. You make me nervous. So can we, you know, we, we had all of our other meetings and all of our day to day, but when we do our one-on-ones, I'd really prefer it if we were just on the phone. And I thought, what a great insight for me that I was coming off, I was kind of like all over her like, I love you so much, I want you to succeed, oh my God. And it's like being a mom that's like, they're like, mom, you're not the boss of me. I actually was the boss of her. But her big fat fail goal that year wasn't actually a professional one. She was killing it at work and, and we we're trying to come up with something, a stretch goal or something. And she said, no, you know what I want my goal this year is to do a triathlon and really you know, to get myself back in shape. And, and, and I said, it's kind of a weird thing to put on your HR thing and be paid for. And, but we did it and it was such a good lesson. It was probably over 10 years ago. And I tell you, I never had a more loyal, active, involved, engaged employee because we honored the piece of her life that needed to be honored at that time in that moment. And she did succeed. She did first a half and then a full try. And I was so incredibly proud of her, but still unable to even do a half. But there's that. That's what Sandy Thompson does it all the time. Um, globally impacting. This is a serious trend. We have a broken nation. We have elections going on across the globe, in Asia, in Europe, everywhere, where we're really struggling with a global availability of cultures, of commerce, of ethics. And yet we have this push to be very, very insular and very, very isolated. And I think this is kind of the, if I, if I change that back into a compute model, we sort of need containers, right? We need to compute and have some VMs inside containers so that you can be whoever you are, wherever you are, but then cultures get to stand on their own and interoperate with the others. But we haven't really figured out the social, cultural, or even compute standards to understand how do we play with a global set of ethics that aren't always the same. Where do we play as we have to pivot as, as people creating those systems? How do we create enough flexibility in the infrastructure so that five years from now, when the populism move, um, movement comes back again, ooh, I don't even know what that was, then we have a place to land when we want to do trade with different nations. So we constantly have to think about what is that global impact for yourself and for others? And I only have one more slide and you're here. I'm so excited I like, brought it home. Oh, I should have ended it earlier. That was a good line. Um, and then always make time to give back. Um, when I was in my most severe depression, um, ugly, ugly, ugly divorce. I don't think there's a pretty divorce out there. If you've had one, please let me know. I sucked at mine. Um, the only thing that really got me through, other than my, my daughters and my friends, was deciding that no matter how bad I felt in any t period of time, and angry and upset and jealous and sad and regretful, I always had something to give, always. I could always go down to the food bank and organize stuff. I could always smile at someone in a coffee shop instead of looking down at my phone. There's always more that you can do. And I tell this to my kids is that the saddest people on this planet right now have the most resources and money and skills and talent because they live like this. They reach out and they grab and they try to take and you can never take enough because someone always has more and they're miserable. The happiest people live like this. I have more to give. It doesn't matter that I was down to six bucks just a couple years ago because of my personal situation, I had more to give. 
I'm the richest person that you know because I have an endless well of, of stuff to give. And we all do. So think about in your professional career, living with your hands open, pulling across the silos, pulling across the generations, pulling up anyone who is different from you and diverse and scared. And some of our white boys are scared right now. <laughs> I'm looking at Chad, he's not scared. <laughs> but you see the fear coming of like, wow, what happens when women do have this financial power? That's scary. So we have to be mindful to bring everyone along. This isn't just a women, women, and women win, and women over men, and no. Live with your hands open and accept the diverse opinions from all that you meet along your journey. So I'll end with my spirit animal, Miss Michelle Obama. <sighs> Michelle. So I thank you very much. I, I am absolutely honored to have been invited here. And thank you for sharing some time and for cleaning the stage so that it wasn't too dirty when I laid on it. <laughs> have a wonderful conference and really enjoy each other and, and make as many connections as you can. Thank you very much.